The Steam Next Fest is a week-long rooftop party where hundreds if not thousands of video game demos explode onto the scene. If you go off-road in a misguided attempt to try as many demos as possible in seven days, it's like being six years old again and wandering through a Spencer's. It starts out family-friendly with big colorful plush mascots in the front. Themes get a little raunchier with potty mouth characters or a little fan service as you step further in perhaps, but they're still safe enough for mass distribution. You get one last warning as the auto-generated tags become sparse, only bothering to label nudity, violence, or gore. And then BAM! It turns into a complete freak show with experimental lighting, federally questionable odors, and Steamboat Willie taking fat rips going abandon all hope ye who enter here. Behind that's the dumpsters. How do you find anything in this place? How do you stand out? That's where I come in. Video game demos are my daily newspaper. I've got the stamina and method necessary to withstand the force of a thousand demos being released all at once. I'll name games that caught my attention this episode, but I'll mostly be focusing on what demos do to catch my attention, or what they do to turn me off, both as a critic and as a hobbyist. There's a saying in the food industry that I think rings true for video games. We eat first with our eyes. Maybe it's an evolutionary trait that makes us pass judgment on sight, our eyes being the first line of defense against dodgy substances our body shouldn't ingest. It's an unavoidable reflex, and like food, if a game looks like it was drop-stop served by a resentful creator, then our eyes signal to our brain to not take a bite. It's more common in early alpha stage games, but some demos do end up in the next fest with their uncooked placeholder art still on full display. You might know the kind I'm talking about. I'm sure you've seen at least one thumbnail that's made up of an Unreal Engine stock location, a rigid character model, and a single word whose font varies depending on game genre. Impact for shooters, chiller for horror, Roboto for puzzlers, Roboto mono medium if there's actually robots. Why should I choose any of these that have no sense of aesthetic, no theme, or don't feel as if they're in a completed enough state when I am surrounded by so many other games that make me feel something? Being nothing gets you disqualified. Being ugly is fine, because being ugly is still being something. And there are plenty of conventionally unattractive games that make it big like, say, Lethal Company. The first click is the first hurdle, and in the world of micro-marketing you need to be loud and upfront enough at a glance to redirect people away from all the other games and into your store page. As a critic, I still feel reflexively repulsed by bad art, but I choke down that feeling because I know what really matters to me is gameplay. And whilst difficult, it is easier to change the art style later than to change the gameplay later. Congratulations. Someone's browsing your store page and wants to know more about your game. Tell them. Be direct. You get one paragraph to explain to people what your game's about. Don't waste your time and theirs on proper nouns that make no sense without in-game context or overused buzzwords like innovative and unique. In Last of the Lost, you are a found and must save the city of unique from the innovation. No. Here's Pepper Grinder's summary, an action-packed 2D adventure blending traditional platforming with an alternate drilling mode that allows you to dive in and out of the earth like a dolphin swims through water. Short, sweet, and alongside the accompanying trailer and screenshots I can get a better understanding of what I can expect. And if I can understand your concepts, then I'm more likely to bring them up in casual conversation with friends, peers, and mailmen. Pepper Grinder, you're a dirt dolphin. Bears in Space, subversive boomer shooter with that 90s sci-fi comedy feel done better than High on Life. Children of the Sun, a sniper puzzler where you take out a coat with only one bullet and psychokinetic powers. Terra Tech Worlds, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolt survival crafter. The question, what is this game, is as crucial as the question, is the game good or bad? Spill as many extra details as you like in the About This Game section, but don't rely on it as a final catch-all. Alright, the demo's installed, it's running, but it can just as easily stop running. I will choke down bad audio, bad controls, and even a few crashes because I know all of that can be ironed out closer to full release, and the point of a demo is to get feedback. Most of my game development experience is in voiceover, writing, and some QA, so if either of the things I'm about to bring up sound like an ignorant ask, it's because they are. First and foremost, audio settings. Terrible audio is as close to a cardinal sin as it gets in gaming. Be careful with 8-bit chiptunes. Give the player the ability to adjust the volume of the music and the action in case the beeps are too sharp or the boops are too crunchy for their liking. Have more than one audio slider, please, if there are multiple sound layers like ambience, music, dialogue, and action sources because sometimes the real issue is the balance. 
I understand this is impossible for every game, as is the case for those wild RTS games or 4X strategy games that you typically only see piloted with a mouse and keyboard on PC. But it's generally worth the time to integrate custom key bindings and, if possible, controller support for accessibility reasons. Otherwise, the only button disgruntled players will look for is the one that lets them close the game. Alt F4 for those on PC. It's game time. Even if your store page raises more questions than it answers and your settings are a hate crime, you get one more chance to make a name for yourself through some gameplay. Tastes differ and what can work for one group of people can fall flat for another. What can you show a player in only a few minutes to make the biggest impact? The answer is a little bit of everything, commonly referred to as the vertical slice. I like a nice one-to-one -one ratio. Take Ingression's demo as an example. If your action platformer is 10% story and 90% platforming, then I want the sampler to consist of 10% story and 90% platforming. A lot of demos feel as if they're made up of 45% exposition, 44% tutorial, and 1% telling me to wishlist. I'll still try my best to work out your vision for the game and wishlist it if I feel the concept was too hard to express on a small scale. Like Sea of Stars, a standout JRPG that won the Golden Joystick Award for Best Indie Game of the Year, with a lukewarm demo. But that wasn't really a surprise because it felt as if the demo did everything else right, and in the end only suffered because the JRPG genre isn't well served in small doses. To that point, be wary of front-loading your demo with heavy narrative world building. I whimper as a critic who has to get through hundreds of other demos that believe they're the only ones with something to say. But a more casual gamer will only go through a handful of demos during the next fest, so it's safer to drop your verbose load on them without fear of fatigue. I say screw the critics and doubly screw streamers who are afraid their audience will click away if there's more than five minutes of reading. However, I will be brutally honest with you and ask you to reflect on whether you truly believe you are the programmer, developer, graphic artist, writer, quadruple threat you think you are. A lot of writing in games feels like a last ditch effort. As if the best way you could transition from one zone to another was having an NPC tell me which way to go. Or perhaps the game's taken inspiration in adding so much writing because other games do. Browsing the top 50 NextFest demos reveals a trend of games with succinct stories so don't feel as if you'll only grab an audience with master storytelling. There are a lot of smaller things to get into, but I'll go ahead and start showing off games that better serve a point. What do we call games that look like older games but take advantage of the tech gap and decades of design innovation to push it a little further than what the old cartridges could allow? Nintendo has left Super Metroid and the first Legend of Zelda for greener, 3 d -er pastures. So it's nice to know indie developers will continue to explore the old styles. As in the case of Aruna and the Necro-Industrialists and Kingsgrave. Aruna specifically is trying to focus on sequence breaking, a difficult design principle to accomplish well on purpose. Meanwhile, Kingsgrave feels like a meteor, more responsive Zelda 1 where you play as a king reincarnated 50 years later to save his kingdom. Hellskate is a funny example because it seems to merge the grinding goodness of PlayStation days past with the current roguelike ability-based trends. But the last known location of my Tony Hawk Pro Skater nostalgia was American Wasteland, so Hellskate might not resonate as strongly with me. I do get this sense that time is an important factor when trying to innovate the past. Deviator and Nevergrave got my attention because they look and play similar to Hollow Knight and Dead Cells, but neither are even a decade old yet. With no meaningful advancements and a few steps back in design, Deviator and Nevergrave risk being drowned in the genre. Being similar to another game is risky, especially with critics and diehard fans. But I don't believe in originality shaming. To say a game feels derivative is to hold my past against it, so I try to balance a spotless mind with memories of a genre I enjoy instead of memories of a specific game. Still, there are advantages to taking heavy inspiration. If I say Realm of Ink is Chinese Hades, that's enough to get some of you sprinting to check out the store page right now. Remember, the first click is the first hurdle. Pacific Drive is a survival crafter where you take care of your car so it takes care of you on a road trip in the Pacific Northwest. The genres exist because people want to have more of the things they enjoy. Depending on the genre, there might be varying expectations for originality, so keep that in mind. But don't be too put off by people who find you unoriginal or derivative or soulless. As a critic, I am exposed to a lot of the same stuff more than the average, so for my own sake, I want palate cleansers here and there. Something with an intense flavor going in a direction I've rarely seen to jolt me out of numbness. Bears in Space is a subversive boomer shooter that consistently hits me with the old razzle-dazzle. 
be it with a high school basketball game or a kaiju romp through the streets. The writing feels like goofy 90s sci-fi schlock a la mom and dad save the world and I don't know where the full game could take me so I'm wishlisting to keep track of it. Children of the Sun goes in the complete opposite direction as a game that feels calculated and uncomfortable. You're hunting down the cult that ruined your life. In every level you scout the perimeter to set up for the perfect shot but you only get one shot. After a successful hit, you redirect the bullet with your psychokinetic powers until you've wiped out every last cultist. There's something about the sinister music and echoing twang of sounds that makes me feel internally off balance as I meticulously mark every target before pulling the trigger and stringing the bullet from one body to the next. The brighter panels of the girl before the worst day of her life and altered lanky character models slinking around in the shadows, stalking her prey, portray an avatar with a disjointed psyche pushed to the brink. On a lighter note, the final chance with me stems from sheer curiosity. I enjoy when developers play around with seemingly random concepts like in Toaster Side. What if you were a toaster assassin and you had to swing around with your power cord until you landed in your target's bathtub? These might as well be prototypes or tech demos that eventually inspire the hit that fulfills the premise. But for an experimental game to pop out of me, it really needs to have a strong idea. I present to you Umber Claw. You are a cat trying to stealth and slink your way out of the underworld to make it back to your loving owner. Every time you die, you are revived with an added animal power. So for example, eagle powers let you double jump. If you die again, you might come back with tiger powers that give you an attack. So as you're dying, the game is getting easier. But narratively, you are growing feral until eventually you go berserk and mutate into a rampaging beast that has to take everything head on. If you die any more than that, then you lose your humanity, uh, catmanity, and can no longer return to your owner. The controls are god-awful, probably gave me some kind of illness. Remapping won't save you and the platform design is kinda weak, but the idea is branded into my brain because I haven't seen many games that reward you for losing and incentivize you to stay in your weakest, most vulnerable form. I desperately want someone to pull it off, so I am keeping a lookout for this game in the future. That should just about do it. There is method to the madness, but in the end, it is madness to go through this many demos. Best of luck to you, gamers looking for your next favorite game, and to you, developers making someone's future favorite game. There were obviously tons more demos that stuck out, both to me and the general public. For this video, I focused on the ones that would best illustrate the points I was trying to make. Clean presentation and accessibility goes a long way. Don't be afraid to be seen as unoriginal. Double and triple down on your themes and don't be afraid to experiment. If I didn't mention a game, it doesn't mean it wasn't worth mentioning. It means I am but one man with one taste whose attention span has run out right about now. This video is sponsored by Spell Rogue, your next deck building roguelike obsession from Guidelight Games and Ghost Ship Publishing. Available now in early access. Cast powerful spells with the mythical mana dice as you manipulate rolls to duplicate, split, flip, and enchant your cards with spell effects to bend fate to your will. Because Spell Rogue has deck building and dice rolling, and that's double the nerd thing. Experiment with dozens of legendary artifacts and hundreds of upgradable spells to build some truly wild combinations, and those will come in handy as you attempt to cleanse the land and annihilate the monstrous Void Walkers. Because let's be honest, voids are very dangerous and nobody should be walking anywhere near them. Head on over to Spell Rogue's Steam page to learn more about the game and join in on the early access adventure today, because those mana dice ain't gonna roll themselves. <laughs>